all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be safe from, from harm. May all beings enjoy happiness. May all beings dwell in an open heart. Thank you all for coming and for your concern about a more compassionate justice system. Discussion is focused on moving from a system of punishment and disconnection to the one of compassion and connection. And the big question is, what is justice? One, there are many, many ways to answer that question, of course. One way is looking at some statistics as to what uh, our justice system in this country, and especially in Vermont, looks like. The U.S. has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population. We have the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world, with over 2.4 million people currently behind bars. Poor people and people of color are incarcerated at vastly disproportionate rates. Getting down to Vermont, 1% of Vermont's population is black. 10% of our incarcerated population is black. One out of 14 black men in Vermont is in prison one of the worst rates in the country. In 2016, there were about 1,750 people incarcerated in the state system, plus about 8,000 on probation. The average cost per inmate per year in Vermont one inmate for one year is $52,224. I multiplied this several times on my calculator because I couldn't believe the number, but the cost per year for incarcerating people in Vermont is almost $11 million. We will explore tonight some more constructive ways that that money might be used. <laughs> Vermont is only one of four states that sends inmates to out-of-state prisons. But there is some good news about Vermont. Vermont is the only state with community justice centers in every county, and you'll hear more about that from <coughs> Derek, who's with the Department of Corrections. You will hear more about that from Megan, who works with the Community Justice Center in Burlington, and a lot more from Yvonne Bird, who is the director of the Montpelier Community Justice Most Community justice centers have some form of reparative panels, and many have COSAs or circles of support for released prisoners, which you may also hear about. What is justice? Cornell West said, Never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. <clears throat> Buddhist teacher David Loy said, Buddhist justice 
grows out of a compassion for everyone involved when someone hurts another. And Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh said, when another person makes you suffer, it is because he or she suffers deeply in himself and his suffering is spilling over. He does not need punishment, he needs help. Happiness and safety are not an individual matter. His happiness and safety are crucial for your happiness and safety. What is justice? We have six people up here who are each working to promote justice as they understand it and based on their experiences. I will introduce each of them and ask them to say a few words about their work with justice. Derek Miyadovna is Community and Restorative Justice Executive for the Vermont Department of Corrections. And in this capacity, he is responsible for the statewide community justice centers and transitional housing program grants that the DOC awards and manages. So, you're on. Tell us what you do. Thank you. Can, can folks hear me? Can folks hear me without it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. I'll just go without if that's okay. But if you're not hearing me, let me know. Um, let me just quickly say it's an honor to be here this evening, to be with my um, co-panelists in being responsive to uh, the community's interest. Um, I think that at the heart of uh, a more just uh, world and community is dialogue. Just this simple but transformational act of engaging and participating in a sharing of perspectives and creating the space for all of those perspectives to be uh, equally privileged and valued and have them permeate one another's perspectives. Mm -hmm. So it's in that spirit that I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I will give a very brief summary of what I do for the Department of Corrections. Um, and in some ways, it's uh, defined, actually, you may be happy to know, in the Vermont statutes. So we actually have a statute. So these are the laws that govern our state. In this case, it's in Title 28. Not to be too wonky about this, but I think this is important. This is about your democracy, right? And we actually have laws that entitle you to many things, one of which is actually restorative justice. So I'm just going to read a tiny bit by way of explaining what I do. And I'll do this hopefully in about 36 more seconds. Um, the state policy, um, it is the policy of this state that principles of restorative justice be included in shaping how the criminal justice system responds to persons charged with or convicted of criminal offenses. The policy goal is a community response to a person's wrongdoing at its earliest onset, and a type and intensity of sanction tailored to each instance of, wrong, of wrongdoing. Policy objectives are to, one, resolve conflicts and disputes by means of a non-adversarial community process, two, repair damage caused by criminal acts to communities <coughs> in which they occur, and to address wrongs inflicted on individual victims, and three, to reduce the risk of an offender committing a more serious crime in the future. That would require a more intensive and more costly sanction, such as incarceration. So this is a lovely and really um, pioneering piece of legislation. How does this happen? One way is that the Department of Corrections invests in a set of community partnerships called community justice centers where local folks such as my colleagues Yvonne and Megan convene 
citizens and the people most directly impacted. So the state devolves or gives to the community the, the uh, resources for them to catalyze the capacity for dialogue in the wake of conflict and crime. And I sit on the uh, correction side responsible for the grants that fund these justice centers and the activities therein. So essentially, I have the privilege and pleasure of giving out all of our taxpayer dollars to support, but also ensure the uh, processes and the procedures that happen through our justice centers. And it's an honor. And I look forward to your feedback over time as to how we can do it better. Thank you, Derek. We have next Tony Monsi, who is a developmental psychologist, a mutual awakening teacher, and founder of the Heart of Advocacy. She can explain that. Her personal and professional lives collided inside a courtroom, igniting her passion for ending relational violence. She herself was a victim of abuse. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Such a contrast from Derek to me. Um, so yes, I am an adult developmental psychologist. Um, so I work with people who don't have diagnoses, but who in fact would like to grow um, and develop and um, be you know, to expand their consciousness and be able to take more perspectives. And essentially probably to um, empower the people, all of us, to be able to, to participate and go in circles where we can actually be in, with, and for one another in the ways that we handle our differences and we move into our shared community. And with the heart of advocacy work I'm doing, um, I work with advocates and in groups, but really um, supporting people who are, right now, um, the main focus has been with victim advocates, <coughs> providing support, supervision, and continuing education in ways to help ignite really the, the, what it takes to have evolutionary relationships. Because what we need if we want to all get along and we want to end relational crimes and probably most crimes is the way to um, really be in, in and for ourselves and with one another in ways that we have relationships that work or that evolve us rather than devolve us. And so the work that I've been doing is around kind of activating the principles that really allow that to take place um, so that we can live in communities that, that work for all of us. And you'll hear a bit more about that when I share my story. Thank you, Tony. Okay. And next we have Megan Lumen, <clears throat> who was incarcerated in Vermont as a first time nonviolent offender. She was the primary caregiver for her daughter, who was 18 months old at the time. She works as offender reentry program assistant at the Burlington Community Justice Center. Megan, can you tell us a little about your work? So I do work with the offender reentry program and the restorative justice program. Um, basically, I spend the money Derek gives us. So, <laughs> um, but really promoting um, restorative justice and offender reentry in more of an aspect of building healthy relationships. I feel like that is vital in um, successfully transitioning from incarceration into back into society and becoming productive in society. And I think I have a unique perspective. Um, I do need a side note though that um, although I do work for the Community Justice Center in the city of Burlington, I am here as a private citizen. So my thoughts and my views are mine and not that of the city. So, um, but, um, I have a lot of support from the city and that's another relationship that I have built and something I think we'll talk more about later. Thank you, Megan. And next we have Ange Green, who was formerly incarcerated in Vermont. And she is working now as the outreach coordinator at Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform. Thank you, Glenda. Uh, my name is Ann Green. I'm the Outreach Coordinator at Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform. Um, I was incarcerated for two years at Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility and decided I wanted to make a difference when I got out and um, started working with Susie and Anna over at Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform. Um, 
I hold educational, well, we as an organization hold educational forums around the state um, focusing on education and advocacy, um, trying to think about the way we address harm within our communities and think about maybe better ways that we can do that. Thank you. I'm going to use my outdoor voice. Right. It doesn't have to <laughs> Director of the Montpelier Community Justice Center and who is totally devoted to restorative justice as an alternative to prison and punishment. And retribution, generally. And retribution. And as you can see, I was really eager to talk about <laughs> what became. Uh, so I, I started, was the director at the beginning of our community justice center here in Vermont, which is almost 14 years ago. And from there we've built, we started with one program and we've built and built and built. And at this point, uh, we have a staff of, of three almost full-time people and one part-time person. We have uh, close to 60 volunteers at any point because our, our programs really depend on community involvement and we have a lot of that. Some, some folks are sitting in the audience here tonight. And we, we in answer to Glinda's question about what's justice, I buy into the notion that it is a state of right relations. And all of what we do is in support of having those right relations in our community. Um, we do some prevention kind of work with uh, classes on conflict resolution skills. We, we actually do a, a parenting class for men who are correction involved um, and various forums and such. And then we, but, we know that no matter what we do, things will happen that disrupt relations. And then we have a number of programs that work with that. We have a victim outreach program where someone from our staff works closely in partnership with the Montpelier Police Department, calling victims in Montpelier in a pretty immediate aftermath of an offense to just check in on them, have that community connection. People seem to really appreciate that circling back after the police have gone. Uh, we have a conflict assistance program where we help uh, neighbors who have conflict with one another or sort of neighborhood issues and such with mediation services. We have restorative justice service for uh, <coughs> folks who have um, incidents of crime from the, uh, you know, vandalism to you know the far end and in all cases where we're looking to help victims have an active role in articulating what they need and having a voice and having the person who has responsible for the offense uh, have a way within the context of community to be accountable for that, understand the harm, and make things better to the extent possible. And then at the, at the far end of our criminal justice system, we have an intercept point where we work with people come, who committed serious violent offenses coming out of incarceration to live in the community under supervision. And in those cases, we provide a circle of support and accountability for each person to help them make that transition in a way that is safe for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Yvonne. And next is Rick Dunworth. You have two microphones. <laughs> you need them. Uh, Rick is a senior student in the Mountains and Rivers Order of Zen Buddhism and the Zen Affiliate Group of Vermont. He is also a spiritual practice advisor for the National Buddhist Prison Center. Rick, will you tell us a little about your work? Sure. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So um, in my working life, I'm a clinical social worker and uh, lived down in, in Rutland. And um, I've also been a Zen Buddhist practitioner for about uh, 30 years uh, now. And uh, that spiritual home for me is in the Catskill Mountains of, uh, of New York State, um, down uh, in Mount Tremper, New York. So my teacher is actually down there. 
But uh, the work I do in relation to uh, prisons is, uh, is a correspondence uh, uh, program. Part of what uh, Glenda mentioned was the National Buddhist Prison Sangha. So as part of, of that work, I write to about 30 to 40 uh, inmates, uh, really all over the country. Um, I've been doing that for about, oh, 15 years or so now. And um, it's a way to encourage and help, uh, help people who uh, are imprisoned, who have an interest in doing a spiritual practice, a Buddhist spiritual practice, and also trying to develop a meditation, especially within the heart uh, of some pretty harsh conditions, um, as you can only imagine. Uh, also, as part of that outreach, uh, for about 10 years, I went out to uh, Great Meadow Correctional Facility. Uh, so it's right on the border of Vermont, if anybody's ever left Rutland heading on Route 4, kind of heading over toward Glens Falls area. Um, at some point, there's a lone traffic light. And at that point, if you look to your left, uh, you'll see about a 30-foot white wall uh, capped in uh, razor wire. And behind that is a very, very old uh, brick prison. Um, and there's about 1,600 inmates in there. And so for about 10 years, I went out and helped co-lead a, a meditation group uh, for, um, for a group of inmates who were trying to do this very thing, is, is develop a spiritual practice within the heart of, uh, of this maximum security prison. So um, again, thank you for being here tonight. responsive to where your curiosity is and where your need for information is. And I do really see this as the beginning of an ongoing dialogue. And I'm very available, again, I work for the state, so I'm at your service. I think a couple of things to understand when I thought about this evening. I thought we, we have a tendency, and I'm, I'm generalizing we as sort of citizens to talk about the criminal justice system. Um, and that may be a misnomer, because I think a system implies sort of a set of intentionally integrated parts that, <laughs> and, and, and embedded in our governmental structure are, are three branches of government. This isn't intended to be a, a civics lesson, but I think it's germane, right? We've got the legislative branch, and the uh, judicial branch and the executive branch. And by design, we have these separate branches so that, of course, no one given branch of government can have a disproportionate amount of control and power. However, the uh, promise and the challenge embedded in that is how do these three big parts that <clears throat> help to stand up this system engage. So, you asked how you get into the system. This is why I mentioned this. A different branch of government, the judicial branch, is essentially the gatekeepers. So you have to go to, you have to be um, arraigned, right? You have uh, due process. You have to be uh, found to have uh, probable cause for having committed uh, something that could be an offense based on our code of law. You have to be then uh, charged with that in a court of law. You have to have your uh, day in court, so to speak, which uh, you do if you choose to um, uh, 
choose to contest it, that's obviously all right, and then ultimately you have to be proven to be guilty of having committed a criminal act. That's how you at least enter the criminal justice system. That doesn't necessarily mean you enter mm -hmm. jail or prison, but you come under some supervisory status. That all takes place in one branch of government, if you will. The Department of Corrections uh, is an executive branch. So we have a set of procedures that we are responsible for enacting and following to supervise people once they've been sent to us. And when to those standards set by the legislature, as well as the courts, we can say they've done this, they've served the entirety of their sentence or the minimum sentence, commensurate with uh, whatever case plan that we've created, then we can release people. So you've got multiple moving pieces. And then one other thing that I just, I think is important because I think it'll circle around themes around tonight, is each county in the state has its own state attorney. And that person's an elected official. They're actually the highest ranking law enforcement uh, person in your county, but we vote for them. And I think that that's important because I think localizing um, participatory opportunities for justices where we're gonna collectively see some more uh, aggregate change. And so you have then within the state different sort of subsystems based on each prosecutor and uh, they have to all function within the, the rule of law but they also have um, different ways of um, approaching what it means to prosecute uh, cases. So. I don't know if I totally answered your question, but I feel like it's important to have a context for the complex and often seemingly disjointed pieces that, again, somewhat intentionally, but somewhat unintentionally, form what we think of as a criminal justice system. I'm happy to give more information. I doubt you're gonna want that. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Thank you. you chance to talk more later, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, this program tonight was organized by the Buddhist Peace Fellowship. We annually present a program uh, on a larger issue of current concern. Climate change was last year. This time it's justice and so we would like to share a Buddhist perspective on this issue. And Rick, if you could say a few words sure. about sure. Buddhist teachings and justice. So just as um, one of the people on the panel said, um, uh, I'm here representing just myself and my, my own view. Uh, and so only in part, uh, the monastery. Um, but uh, so Buddhism itself uh, primarily is a contemplative uh, religion. Um, meditation is at the heart of most Buddhist practice, no matter what school of, of Buddhism we're from. Uh, but from its very earliest times, uh, there's been a very strong social justice uh, ethic. Um, and really stemming from the perspective of, of uh, compassionate action. So that being the heart of much of Buddhist teaching. And according to the, to the Buddha, um, as human beings, we all make choices, um, karma. And these choices inevitably have consequences. So we learn to watch, we learn to pay attention uh, to those choices, to those consequences. Uh, we watch and hopefully learn and see what happens as we negotiate our way through the world. And if these choices are informed by wisdom and compassion, 
then the Buddha taught that the outcome will be beneficial uh, for us individually, for society, for our communities. If they're informed by what in Buddhism we call the three poisons, so greed, anger, and delusion, then the outcome will invariably be suffering. And again, suffering is individuals and communities, society. So it's interesting historically to look back and see some of the things happening. But in the Buddhist time, in the sphere of social justice, uh, there's an example of a ruler who followed uh, the Buddha's advice. And that ruler, some of you have heard the name King Ashoka. So he lived um, from 304 to 232 before the Common Era. And we know of this Ashoka from Buddhist and other Indian teachings, other Indian legends, but also from his own words that are inscribed on numerous edicts uh, still can be found over India. So this Ashoka inherited a vast empire. It was in northern India. And uh, he immediately proceeded to consolidate that empire, but in a very aggressive manner, a very warlike manner. And at some point in his life, he was exposed to the teachings of the Buddha, became a disciple of the Buddha, and felt a tremendous remorse for his actions, his previous actions. He expressed this sorrow and repentance and changed his way of governing, changed his way of being a king, being a ruler and started uh, using nonviolence and expressions of nonviolence within this area of India. And as a ruler, he also looked at how people were um, treated who had done some type of um, infraction or were, were perceived as doing some sort of infraction to the community. So he found ways to extend amnesty to people who were jailed, who were imprisoned, and tried to do that whenever and wherever possible, and also created measures for uh, rehabilitation at a very early stage um, in looking at that possibility. So in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition of which Zen and Tibetan Buddhism are a part. The ideal of spiritual practice is that of the Bodhisattva. And again, it's a name that uh, many of you may be familiar with, but if not, so it's this ideal of a Bodhisattva. And this is someone who dedicates their life to the welfare of all beings. So in whatever capacity they find themselves in the world, whatever path they've taken in terms of their own work, um, this ideal of trying to extend a, a bodhisattva way of being becomes the ideal. So working for a more compassionate and just prison system truly fits in with this bodhisattva way of life, this bodhisattva ideal. Thank you, Rick. Now, we get into the dialogue, we get into the conversation, we get into the stories. And we have three very courageous women up here who have stories to tell. And I don't have any particular order. Uh, if you would keep to about five minutes. I know I've heard some of his stories at length and they are very moving stories and I'm sorry we don't have more time but this is only the beginning of our conversation. So Megan, you want to go first? Yes. We have, let me say after this, 
uh, Rick and John and Derek will respond to these stories, to the storytellers, to the issues raised. However, this starts our conversation. And we will have a break. And most people have restrained themselves from the <laughs> beautiful array of food over there. <coughs> it will be a time to eat and visit. And we will come back, and you will become part of this conversation, and we will invite questions and comments from the audience to these <coughs> folks. So that's, that's the shape of the evening. And Megan, if you would start us off. Yes. So again, I'm Megan. Um, in 2010, I was incarcerated as a first-time nonviolent offender. Um, my crimes actually did happen in 2008. Um, I was arrested a year later. Um, my husband and I actually were both arrested. Um, we were put in jail, $25,000 bail for each one of us when we were a low income family. Um, thankfully, my parents bailed me out because um, as it was stated, I was um, the primary caregiver for our daughter who was 18 months old. When we were bailed out, um, we owned a house together in St. Albans, and the courts first told us um, for a month that we weren't allowed to speak. We couldn't sell our house. We couldn't raise our daughter together. We could no longer live together. Um, they ordered us both to move back in with our parents, so ultimately we ended up having to sell our home. Um, after fighting with the courts for a month, we were able to finally have contact um, because we did have a daughter in a house that we needed to deal with. Um, and thankfully, with my parents bailing me out, um, I was actually out, um, out on bail for a year before I finally went to report to serve my time. Um, I happened to end up in a county where the state's attorney um, is definitely harder on women. My husband, who committed a burglary, served 57 days had five years of probation, and was released off probation after two and a half years. I was charged with aiding in the commission of that burglary. I did seven months in jail, and I am still currently under supervision with Department of Corrections because I did have a street sentence that required me to um, be released on furlough and then make parole. Um, there were six co-defendants, and I'm the only one still under supervision, but I'm also the only one that's never been in trouble since I was incarcerated. So it's an interesting um, standpoint, being a female in the mix. Um, again, I think it gave me a great perspective, though. I landed um, at the Community Justice Center doing a work experience um, under Karen Bastine, and she is the one that actually really pushed me to start believing in myself. And although I've had some negativity with Department of Corrections, I also owe my first positive relationship to them because um, my probation officer was out of St. Albans. And when I left jail, um, I actually entered into the Lund Residential Treatment Program and did nine months of treatment with my daughter with me. And uh, my probation officer at that time um, actually drove from St. Albans to Burlington to meet with me. Um, I had initially only wanted to do 90 days, and um, it was a, one of his meetings with me where um, he had just asked me what I was rushing to. Um, you know, I was, I had a home, I was out of jail, I was with my daughter. Um, he had asked me um, to give it three days. Just think about it for three days, and if I wanted to continue on with submitting a residence, he would do that, but to just consider it. and. Um, it was that conversation that actually um, made me decide to want to stay, and it was my last um, five months at Lund that was really um, the key turning point for me. Um, having supports that believed in me um, with Department of Corrections, with one, eventually with the Community Justice Center, um, which led to the City of Burlington, and a bunch of other agencies that I now work with. Um, it helped with my healthy relationships. Um, my crimes were actually due to an unhealthy relationship and a drug addiction. And when you mix the two, um, that's how you end up in the criminal justice system. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Ange, would you yeah, um, tell your story? 
My name is Ange. Uh, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I hear you. Could you use the mic? Yeah. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I moved to Vermont in 2009, um, addicted to opiates. And um, I came up here to seek medication assisted treatment and was put on a waiting list where I was told to wait and basically keep using until availability opened up where I could get treatment. Um, a series of bad events happened in between and I ended up uh, getting charged with a felony um, of assault and robbery resulting in injury. Um, I too was in an unhealthy relationship and um, I was in the same room as something that had happened and left and unfortunately didn't call the police and uh, now am labeled a violent offender. Um, this uh, affects my life and employment and all sorts of other ways. Um, thank God I work at BCJR and I love the work that I do there. Um, when I got out of jail, well, I went to jail for two years. Um, I got, I've been out almost a year now, the 25th will make a year. Um, I wanted to make a difference and change and not be another statistic. So, um, like I said, the work I do at BCJR, um, and I changed while I was in jail. I was uh, working, helping people in jail who don't have effective counsel, I would give them legal advice and help them with their cases. Um, like I said, uh, three years clean, I've been out of jail a year, and uh, I do work all across the community, and I really enjoy what I do. Thank you. What, and what was it that sort of turned you around? What support or... I think sitting back in jail and watching it be a revolving door, and I didn't want to be one of the people who came back and back and back. I went to transitional living at Northern Lights, and they helped me establish independent living, which um, without programs like that, it makes uh, offender reentry almost impossible. Thank you, thank you. And now, Tony. Your story. I know the long version of your story, and I'm sorry you can't share that. But Not a problem. <laughs> share what is All important. Right. I will share a bit, um, and I'm going to use a little too cheap because it's a long story. I'll keep me on track. And um, a bit of a different story um, from these two lovely, brave young women up here. Um, and it's a, a, a familial story. So I never met my paternal grandfather. In 1938, he shot himself in the heart with a 35 caliber rifle at a gold mining camp outside of Chicken, Alaska. My father never talked about either of his parents. And for a number of reasons, about a seven years ago, um, after quite a journey, I found in the bowels of the Minnesota Historical Society over 350 pages documenting my grandfather's history with the criminal justice system and the major crime for which he was tried by jury and committed was carnal knowledge of girls under the age of 18. So when I discovered that truth, not an easy one to swallow, but it was something that, um, something in me settled because my life all of a sudden made sense. Um, you know, the abuse that I myself had suffered um, all of a sudden made sense. So a few years ago, after um, having some time dealing with uh, the, the findings of my grandfather, I decided to go to a sentencing of a man who, was being, who had been convicted of crimes similar to my grandfather's, and he was being sentenced in, in Burlington. And I wanted to go in order to see where I was in my own healing process. And so this man was a man who was convicted of a, a, a violent sexual um, crime. And so I knew that I could go into the courtroom and empathize and be compassionate for the victims in that crime. But I wanted to go and see if I could also keep my heart open to him, because I am the grandfather of a man like him. So during the sentencing, members of the family stood up to speak, and the first two stood at a podium and faced the judge. But when it came time for the grandmother of the victim to speak, she 
bypassed the podium, climbed up onto the witness stand, and faced the offender directly. She laid into him like only the best grandmother could. <laughs> You know, we took you into our family, we loved you, we did nothing but welcome you, you betrayed us. And at one moment she demanded that he look at her. And she pointed her finger at him and she said, there is nothing good about you. And in that moment, it was like my heart burst open and the entire courtroom filled with a golden white light. And for the first time in my life, I knew something, and I'm gonna, <laughs> I'll get right to it. I knew that what she'd said wasn't true. Because when she pointed at him, she pointed straight through to me, and to my children, and to all of us in the courtroom, and to all of us here today. Because we are all born innocent and vulnerable babies. We are all inherently good. And the personal healing I had in that courtroom, washed in that white golden light, was that for the first time in about 50 years, I think I was back then, or somewhere in there, I knew and felt my own inherent goodness. But more importantly, as a professional, I really saw that we can end relational violence now. We can do this, um, uh, let me go back to my notes because I'm getting lost here. Yeah, so, yes, I saw that we have what it takes to end relational violence now and to end the patterns of these crimes that can keep happening in families. So it's 2017. We know about epigenetics and neuroplasticity, healing trauma, developing greater conscious awareness. We know about open hearts, compassion, connecting, we know about how to clear the blocks in our unconscious that keep us all stuck. And we know very specifically about the types of holding environments that allow us all to unfold and grow into our highest potentials. So as victims, we need you. We need advocates. We need communities that believe in us and see us, that see straight through our addictions, that see through our depression, our rage, our confusions about how to find our own voices and how to find our power. When we can't believe in ourselves, we need you to see that in us and to pull it out, pull our goodness out so that we can stand and walk and be in the communities in the ways that we're all meant to be. And as offenders, we need you. We need advocates. We need people to hold us accountable for our behaviors so that we stop those behaviors. And we need you to see our inherent goodness because we can't see it. If we could see it, we wouldn't do what we're doing. It wouldn't make sense. So we need you to hold that vision of how we can get from here to there with people who believe in us so that when we don't know the path, you show us the path. Because if we knew it, we'd be on it. So for me, at the heart of advocacy really is the call for all of us to be in, with, and for one another in ways that draw out our inherent goodness and beauty <laughs> and truth of all of us. And you know, together we really can reimagine justice in the ways that we're speaking to the choir here, in the ways that are being talked about up here, that we can reestablish um, justice so that its epicenter is about cultivating the highest potentials in all of humanity. So that we create moment by moment lives, um, a world where our lives are transformed, where we're all free to live into our essential uniqueness within communities that are safe for all of us. That's my story for today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Tell me. I live to revive and Rick and Derek to respond to any of the stories that have been told, to the issues that these stories raise, to whatever you would like to say in response. Thank you. Is there a mic? 
I, I just in listening, um, and just especially, I just wanted to ask, at some point as you were telling your story, you talked about um, helping, helping others. And uh, I think you found uh, a way to do that um, from a legal perspective. Uh, but uh, I was especially in, intrigued, I mean, just this idea of, of um, extending yourself, reaching out, helping others as a way to kind of help yourself. So I wondered if you could say a little more about that. Um, helping others definitely does help myself. Um, even still, I find myself doing extensive peer support out of, for the girls out of Northern Lights. Um, so often in these situations, uh, forensic peer support is not available for the girls and just positive female role models or anybody they can call with questions that aren't an authoritative figure is so lacking. I'd just like to note too, um, Ange and I both attended residential treatment programs and both found a path to fixing what we saw was broken, I guess, too. So um, putting money into treatment facilities, I think, is key um, because for a lot of us um, addicts, um, it is what saves us. It's what gets us back um, on the right track and where we need to be. Yeah, and it was actually at a, a treatment center where um, I spent two months, um, not the traditional 28 days, but in the second part of my stay, um, we did a family tree where we looked at actually the psychopathologies in the family systems, and it was that project that led me on the journey to find the truth about my, my grandfather. And so treatment is critical. You know, having any of us, whether we're victims or offenders, in spaces that are safe, where we can have some trust and ability to be able to open up to some of the truths that are deep within us that we can't in other places is absolutely critical. And to being able to develop the kind of relationships that, that any of us have, have done that with people like you named Karen and, and others you told me earlier, that see us and they can pull that out. Because sometimes it's not so easy. So I agree wholeheartedly that, that um, safe and, and um, available treatment centers that are key. And with restorative justice too, there's 21 CJCs in the state of Vermont, all of which offer some sort of restorative justice. Um, I am a believer that um, any nonviolent offender, I think, should have the option of going through restorative justice. It gives you a chance to repair the harm that you've caused with you know, the people that, victims, the people that are directly affected, um, the community, and ultimately with yourself too. So, I, we have the programs, we should utilize them. So could somebody explain ex how the, the process of restorative justice? I was gonna, well, I was, I was, I was you want to hear? Use of life I was thinking about, in your case, how that might have played out differently. So you were, a, 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 was it an accessory to a burglary? And my victim was uh, my biological father. So okay. it was a... So, uh, yeah. so even more importantly, in terms of the relationship that was broken down in the trust and such, and that, that you know, had there been in lieu of your separation from your child, incarceration and all that, this opportunity in the context of community, because th th those conversations are very hard one-on-one. -on -one. If it's just you and your father, it might have been too hard. But when you have that conversation with the natural community or when they're not always that, as we use it, the restorative justice panels, to help you really hear the harm, as he describes it, the harm to community, and to give him the opportunity to talk about what that was like for him, what he needed from it, whatever questions he had for you, and that, you know, with the support of whatever community would be there to help the two of you construct a plan 
for what it would take for you to make amends and to have it get to that place of being settled. And it actually works when if you and your father and whoever else in the family was affected crafts that plan. It's, it's something that no one can do for you because they don't know who you are and your backstories and it has to come from the heart. And we've seen it happen so many times and it would have made everything different. It, absolutely. Um, one of the hardest things the day of my sentencing, um, being the offender, um, you have the victims have the opportunity to say what they need to say can't say anything back and I had to sit into in a courtroom my daughter was two and a half at this time and listen to this man um, who is supposed to be guiding me um, tell me um, in the court that my daughter was better off without me and I um, how I deserve to be in jail um, that I should spend the next 10 years in jail and what that ended up doing to myself was like Oh, it was such a blow. I think that's why when I did come out of the criminal justice system, I had such low expectations of myself and of what I was capable of doing. I remember my first six months being out, I um, had become accustomed to the fact that I would never be anything more than a warehouse worker. I wasn't going to have a career. I was a two-time felon with a drug addiction that, you know, my daughter was better off without me. Um, the community was better off without me. So even if um, we weren't able to repair our relationship, um, that would have at least given me the opportunity to repair the relationship with myself and maybe for him to find a way to repair um, what I broke for him too. So I think it also gives you or the person in your seat um, that opportunity to really consider what you did and why it matters and the impact of that, which is a very different uh, consideration from what people who are in the courtroom or throughout that criminal justice proceedings are focusing on, which is kind of their own well-being because they don't know what's going to happen, what's going to be done to them protecting themselves. and. In, and that becomes what you focus on as opposed to what was wrong with what I did, which is the, which is the growth experience, not, not the other. So that's, the, that's, that's what I'd like to see more of. I'm sorry that happened to you. And, and the other thing I would say, though, is you, you both spoke about addiction. And, you know, we've, restorative justice doesn't address addiction. You know, it's a, it, it requires a treatment, the kind that apparently both got in a different kind of model, but they're not incompatible. Uh, one of the conversations that I'm, I'm sort of having and going to have another one next week is, you know, how we hook the restorative process onto the treatment courts, the drug courts, so that someone goes to drug court and goes through that kind of high accountability and treatment and such, and, and at that far end when they're when they're sober, when they're on that path, that then they can also uh, work through what they did and come to a place where they've they've made amends to the extent that they can. And although restorative justice doesn't um, address addiction, um, it opens up the conversation for you to have that conversation in a safe space um, with other community members. So, um, and in Chittenden County, we have Rapid Intervention Community Court, which is um, a program that's designed to offer those wraparound services if they're needed. So, which is really successful in Chittenden County, I might add. So, <laughs> other responses? I just want to acknowledge, I don't think I'm good, I just want to acknowledge just the, the courage to tell the story and tell your story to, in a public forum and resilience, the resilience that you've all generated. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the New York Times ran a piece called, it was an opinion piece, 
called Justice Springs Eternal. It's an optimistic piece. I recommend it. I can get you the link. Um, but it picked up on a, uh, there's a quote here that picked up on what you were saying. It says that um, those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Yet until very recently, formerly incarcerated people and their families were rarely heard from in criminal justice debates. So an iteration of restorative justice as defined by involving the people most directly involved is having all stakeholders, certainly including people who've been customers uh, you know, of the criminal justice system, give voice to that experience. Because as you said, I mean, we, we need to learn. We need to listen and learn. So I just, I'm appreciative of that. I just want to offer my humble listening appreciation. Um, because chances are, if you run a system like that, until pretty recently, chances are you didn't get to that position by having experienced it on the other side. However, we are seeing increasing numbers of people in increasing decision-making positions who have lived experience. And we're all the better for it. Go ahead. Well, I, I thought I might talk a bit about another way back from incarceration with community support other than the residential treatment, if people are interested in that. Sure. It's what we're doing here in Montpelier, um, where we, uh, for each person who we bring into our program as they're being released from incarceration and still uh, under supervision of the community, we form what we call a circle of support and accountability. That circle comprises that core member, three people from the community who volunteer, and a staff person from the Community Justice Center. And it's a long-term, intensive relationship building process where we provide someone, form with someone an intentional community uh, that kind of walks with that person through at least the first year. Uh, after they're released and supporting them and living an accountable life in, in all the ways that, that, what that means, but basically a life defined by them. Um, so it's, it's one of, I guess, uh, like fellowship with other people. We have several people volunteer in that who may have other words for their experience in it. And so that's, that's a different model that we're doing a lot of here in Washington County. It, and I had one other thing I was going to say, because when you were talking, you were talking about restorative justice, that some of you may know John Gorsuch because he lives here in Montpelier, and it was when he was commissioner of corrections that he brought the restorative justice into corrections and, and started the restorative justice panels and ultimately the found the money for CJC's. And something that he said is that he regrets is uh, going with kind of the pressure to sell this new idea by uh, limiting restorative justice to the lowest level misdemeanor offenses, when in fact it's even more applicable and needed with high, higher level offenses. $62,000 a year for incarcerating yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if I can pick up on one other yeah. theme that maybe will resonate for folks in thinking about uh, the elements of all of your stories, one thing that I experienced that runs consistent with what restorative processes do is they allow space for new narratives to surface. And the narratives that we carry about ourselves, our self-stories, I heard something in each of your stories about how at a critical moment you took ownership in a new way of your self-story. That notion, I, I always thought I'd be a warehouse worker. You know, I know, I knew that woman was not speaking truth at that moment, you know. Um, and I think restorative justice processes are the containers and the spaces that allow or at least facilitate better opportunities 
for people who carry somewhat condemnation scripts, self-defeatist narratives that have been imposed upon them and that they've internalized, and to some extent may in fact play out over time, I think we're sort of processing that, are places derived by the legitimacy of relationship that allow people to begin to give birth and veracity to new self stories. And then it's hopefully in the context of uh, primary relationships and broader community relationships that those new self stories, those new narratives, those aspirational stories can actually be realized, be made true. And I feel like I, I heard that in all of yours. And I think everyone had some beautiful mix of where you were on your own journey and then these other pieces that then supported that. The PO who just said, consider that. The research that led you to see something, then the instinct that brought you to you know, all of these. So, you know, I don't think there's a silver magic potion, but restorative justice creates the spaces that I think when a somewhat mysterious but also very real set of factors are in place, people take, get new self stories, and not just the people who are offenders or victims. I just, I guess the other thing I will say is that we all get new stories going about ourselves and who are the offenders in our community and who are the victims in our community. And I think that's equally important. Um, and that's why dialogue and restorative processes, I think, are uh, essential for promoting this notion of a, a more compassionate system because we, uh, we hold each other and in turn we're changed. Can I just add a bit to that? Just I love everything you just said and a couple of the words you used, you know, that the restorative practices in the circles or even in this room, we have a container where compassion is present and you can feel it. If compassion wasn't here, it'd be, it would feel very different. If there wasn't trust or safety here, it would feel very different. And this is the kind of environment we all need in order to be able to relax enough to really connect. And so one of the things that I do in my profession is I awaken, support people to awaken the space between us, the invisible space that actually holds much of what causes the problems for us, and so that we can pay attention to the space that if Derek and I were looking at each other and couldn't hold eye contact, it would be a sign something's there that we can be with and stay. And we need one another to support one another to be able to stay in the uncomfortable positions or in the uncomfortable um, emotions that we often have that cause us to react. So when we know more and more, we can stay with one another through those things and awaken that space and not make those things become actions that are, you know, then need to have um, corrections done, then there's more, there's just so much more hope. And we need one another to do that. You know, a lot now we do our individual practices, but we really do need to be able to stay in with and for one another with the hard things so that we can continue to clear this space that's between us that has the, the, the stuff that you talked about with your father. You know, there's stuff. Who knows what it is, but it's probably, it's probably lineage even. Sometimes it's stuff that we carry with us from way back we don't even know. You know, so being able to have communities that support us, um, like, I just forgot your first name, I'm sorry, Yvonne, was saying, you know, to have the whole room full of people that are there, it supports so, we have so much more capacity when we have one another, that we can be with those things that brings healing. And the, the bigger the crimes, often that's like the same thing with the broken bone. It just comes, it can, it is possible, that then the relationships can come be healed and come back that much stronger, not just for the individuals, like you just said, but for the entire community. Because if so-and-so can do it, if you can do it, you can do it, you know, my family can do it, we, we all can. You know, it makes it all much more possible. So awakening that space between us, I think, is one of, the, one of my passions, is to help more and more of us be able to do that and live in with and for one another. Before we take our break, I would just like to say a couple of brief things. One is the importance of what you said, Tony, about being able to see the goodness in yourself. And I think restorative justice does that. It sees that. When we're focused on guilty or innocent punishment, 
we are not seeing the good, we're seeing the bad. This doesn't help anybody. We will now take 10 minutes or so for refreshments. Uh, conversation, we have some people uh, in our audience, Susie Wizzywaddy is here, Director of Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform. If you want to speak with her and, of course, any of these folks, we have at the Buddhist Peace Fellowship table a list of resources, uh, readings, videos, organizations to be in touch with. There are tables on this side once you've gotten something to eat with literature from a number of organizations that work for justice in various ways. And there is a donations basket. If anybody came in the back door and didn't get the opportunity to make a donation, um, it's there. And we will, uh, I will ring the gong when we're ready to return. It's great that there's so much conversation going on and the food will continue to be here and we're getting back now to expanding our conversation to include all of you. There have been a couple of requests that everybody up here, no matter how loud they think their voice is, <laughs> use the microphone. We are, well, I should say, Jerome is videoing this session, and it will be available in a couple of ways. It will be, once it's edited, it will be on channel 15. It will also be on YouTube. Orca YouTube. Orca YouTube. And the Buddhist Peace Fellowship has a Facebook page, and we will post a link yes. to this when it is up and edited. So now to all of you, one at a time, we have a traveling mic. So just raise your hand if you want to say something, question, comment, Susie. whatever. Susie. Thank you. I wanted to say two things aside from just thank you all. Um, earlier, when Derek was talking about the three different branches of government and the way that the system works and how you get into it, I want to make two small clarifications. <coughs> <laughs> One of them has to do with the legislative branch. And then what's, I think, really important that people understand is that crime is not something that is given from, you know, defined by you know, some holy authority. Crime is defined by all of us through our legislative elected leaders. So when we think about somebody committing a crime, it's, it is worth our remembering that that all kinds of new things are criminal now that were not criminal five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, especially around drugs and, and the other you know, behaviors that have, um, have changed over time. We have criminalized new behaviors, which is one of the reasons we have more people in jail. And, and the other thing around the, that you mentioned um, around being proven guilty, I think it's also worth, probably most people in the room know this, but the fact that 95% of the cases that come through the criminal justice system are resolved by plea bargain is not, does not mean that you're proven guilty. It means that you agree to a plea, which may be what you did and very well may not be what you did. It may be something near what you did, related to what you did, but it's a plea bargain that goes on your record that then becomes the, the written expression of truth that may or may not bear much of actual resemblance to the truth. Thanks. Can I respond to that? Yes. Well, hear me now? Yep. 
thank you. I was really hoping that you know somebody, you or somebody, would you know put, put a little finer point on that. Um, and, and those are those are those are key key pieces um, to highlight. So I I do uh, appreciate that. Um, I will say though that um, that may be how you enter it, but once you are in um, the correction system, um, there are a lot of rules and laws, so to speak, in corrections that an offender then needs to follow. And these are normal laws. Um, corrections decides our housing, decides what we can do, when we can do it, where we can go, what time we have to be home. There are very, very strict rules um, with Department of Corrections, and I do feel like um, there are some changes that we can make. Um, Department of Corrections has to approve housing for anybody that's um, being re released on furlough, and currently we have 150 people in Vermont that are being held for lack of housing, mm -hmm. and that is not a, that rule is not implemented by our government, that is by Department of Corrections, so. <laughs> um, where's the mic? He's coming with it. Actually, I have a loud voice. I may not need it. Uh, my name is Jacob Stone. I've been a volunteer with the VONS program with the Montpelier Community Justice Center for about three years now since we moved to Vermont. I have an observation I'd like to share with you and ask for any feedback you might have about it, especially from Derek and Megan, because your comments kind of touched on that. I've served on, uh, well, four COSA teams in, in the years that I've been here. The first one was spectacularly successful. The guy finished his year. He's now back with his family, working, making solid money, doing great. The next two didn't go so well. I won't bore you with the details right now, but they didn't go well. And I've reflected on the difference between first one and the next two. The difference was the level of community and family support that the first guy got. His family rallied around him. It was, by any reasonable definition, a functional family. Uh, he came out, he had the support of the COSA team, of uh, the Justice Center, and his family. Did great. The next two had virtually no family support. And what family contact they had was actually more harmful than, than positive. Uh, and I came to, to the sense that what the community offers, the community being family and the community itself, is a pivotal factor in whether people are going to make it. Some of these guys come out with virtually no life skills, a simple job of budgeting, something I'm not great at either, but you know, at least I know my limits. Uh, knowing to save some money to pay the rent. It's, it's a foreign language for them. Uh, and then on top of that, they encounter obstacles that sometimes seem to me in my darker moments to be almost deliberate. Uh, that they have to go to various programs and counseling at times when they would and should be working. When finding a place to live is an almost insurmountable obstacle when the best money they're going to make is minimum wage, when for some of them they have to disclose that they're sex offenders to landlords, to neighbors, to employers. Um, the point I'm sort of circling around is that it seems to me that the support that we as, as a state, as a community, as, as neighbors, offer or withhold is a pivotal factor. And I've come to recognize, for myself anyway, that the <coughs> services being provided now are just not enough. I see what the COSA volunteers do, I see what the Justice Center staff does. The staff is just a heroic bunch of folks working really hard. But it's like, you know, standing up against a tidal wave of obstacles. So it's, it's been frustrating. When I look at this first guy who had all this support and the next two who didn't have any support, it makes me question what more we could do as a community to, to help people get readjusted. 
from a practical perspective, from a tangible perspective, I wonder about transitional housing, uh, more, more supervised housing, helping people learn the life skills that you used to learn in home economics class when I was in high school, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I've talked enough. I'd be interested in any feedback you might have. Thank you for devoting clearly your time and your commitment and um, your compassion to being a COSA volunteer. Um, that's walking the walk right there. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I heard is like, how do you create a substitute for some of those really primary relationships that kind of keep us tethered to some, you know, uh, you know, basic, uh, you know, pro-social, productive, um, community-based life. And, um, you know, I think circles of support and accountability, uh, as I think your, the, the, your kind of different examples set, uh, kind of showed a little bit, like, they provide something very powerful, but they're not necessarily, at least in all cases, always enough. And so where do we get the stuff that, you know, fills in that, you know, enough? That's the heart of my question. Um, yeah, and, and I hear it, and I hear it. I wish I had a good answer. Other than that, I think we ask ourselves this question a lot as a community of practitioners. I think one of the amazing things about Vermont is that we have a very ongoing, um, bi-directional conversation between the practitioner community that Yvonne and her colleagues represent and the Department of Corrections through um, my unit as well as the local offices. Um, I think um, it brings into mind um, where um, obviously this corrections is kind of a downstream organization like when all else fails and so many other systems tend to fail people we sort of end up supervising them but aren't necessarily um, set up to address the myriad real and human needs that they have that no doubt may have contributed to some of the behavior that led them into our system, but we don't really have the tools that they may need as a human to adequately get them out of that system. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> I can only, I, all I can really do is uh, acknowledge and empathize that with the question and that you're doing what you can do. I guess, let me, I'll do one other thing, if I may, and then Megan, all yours. I'm gonna read you my favorite kind of quote about communities and the power of communities. Um, it's got by a, a Norwegian named Nils Christie. And um, he, he said this, community is made from conflict as much as from cooperation. The capacity to solve conflict is what gives social relations their sinew. Professionalizing justice steals the conflict, robbing the community of its ability to face trouble and restore peace. Mm -hmm. Communities lose their confidence, the capacity, and finally, their inclination to preserve their own order. They instead become consumers of police and court services with the consequences that they largely cease to be communities. Mm, yeah. mm. Isolation. What year do you think he wrote this? Mm. Wouldn't dare guess. 1977, okay? So I think what you're doing is reclaiming what he calls conflict as property that belongs to the community. Um, we, have a, we have professional systems for all sorts of human needs, but there's no branch of government that is nor necessarily could or should be responsible for the social contract, right? That takes place in private homes mm -hmm. and gets enacted in public spaces. So the question becomes, how can we make a robust social contract absent any one institution that bears responsibility for it? And I would submit that it's through conversations like this, 
volunteering for community justice, having these stories get out, and iterating those little connections that create bridging capital. The bridging capital that Megan got that took her from being uh, you know, a client of the Department of Corrections to now uh, an employee within this system. People extended their capital of relationship, of things that said, hey, there's this tier of society that we need you in as well. So I think it, it comes down to collaboration between professionals and non-professionals. That's the best I got. Um, pretty much what I was going to say, um, in Burlington we have so many local organizations and I think um, for our POSAs, um, some of the successful ones, when there isn't the family support um, that we would hope to be, um, we've seen agencies like Mercy Connections and Pathways and Howard Center and so many other agencies that will fill that void, that will step in, and volunteers. I mean, the volunteers in the community are so important. Um, and I cannot express that enough because, like you said, some of these guys get out and oh, my supervisor, we actually just had two get out on Monday and he had to pick them up and bring them to their apartment and bring them grocery shopping and really filled the role of helping them with everything because they didn't have anybody. Um, one had been in for 15 years and had stepped out and it, he was very overwhelmed and was like, okay, what's this phone thing? And yeah, they, these ATMs are different. Everything was just very shocking. So um, yeah, like Derek said, agencies, volunteers, um, and creating, I guess, a space for that. <laughs> And I'll just offer um, a couple of thoughts with all of this too, that um, you know, there, we're kind of at a place right now in our society, I think, where just a lot of things aren't working. Like there's not working. And then we kind of get stumped at what do we do? And it's uncomfortable to be in the not knowing. And so there's almost ways to keep doing what you're doing or doing what we're doing here, but to come together as a community and staying with, we just don't even know what to do. And I, actually, I read something recently that Charles Eisenstein wrote about that, that, you know, to also be asking, you know, what's it like to be you? You know, so really wanting to understand what it's like to be another person um, and to be with them in it. So we're not just asking them and being across from them, but we're kind of inside their consciousness being them so we really get it. So we would know kind of like, if I were you, I would have done that too. Um, so that we're understanding really what's going on. So if we're willing to not know, if we're willing to be in reality together with actually what's going on, and then also then being able to look at what's below the symptoms, what's really needed by those two men. You know, below, I mean, maybe it's housing, maybe it's whatever, but a lot of it, you named it, it's people, it's us, it's more of us somehow coming together, you know, like you're already doing the COSA, but it needs, like, it amps it up almost, like, how much can we have so that we can be with people, because it's actually the connection, the vibration of the connection is what undoes whatever is not able to connect, and sometimes it's messy and ugly as it does that. But you know, for these men, maybe they needed to just have enough love and compassion around them that you kind of fall apart even more, so you can get you can get all of that out, so you can then start getting put back together. But the, you know, the answers are we can't legislate it or govern it, but it is going to be about how can we be. And I used the holding environment earlier. It's like we all, if we all came into families, it, you know, and, and we can't because we come from connection from wherever we are, not in bodies, to here where we're kind of we think we're separate beings in space. We're not. We're interconnected. You know, where does Megan's field end and mine start? I mean, where does any of us? We're all in this together. So the more that we can have that be a place of compassion and love, it will start to undo the, some of the patterns that are holding people back. And it will also allow us to connect more and more with them when it's not going so well so we can keep in there till it can go well. So that's not an answer other than to be willing to come together to not know. And then to really allow something new to happen because what we're doing right now isn't working. I just want to throw in one other thing. Change is a uh, uh, process, right? Uh, um, 
not a um, you know a singular um, uh, you know moment, right? So I would encourage you to hold out the space to reframe those other two coses as part of an iterative process. You know, whatever you held out, whatever you were willing to offer to those two individuals, it might not have been a function of a deficit that if there were more of. It might be a function of some interaction between that and what it meant to receive that. And, you know, people generally make changes, and this is outside the criminal behavior realm, usually reflect on it taking a long time. So uh, we have this conversation a lot. When is the right person in their stage of change process to get into a COSA? If they're pre-contemplative, in other words, they're not really giving any thought to the fact that they're engaging in a pattern of behaviors that causes harm to self and others, COSA is probably not going to be the thing that moves the dial necessarily. We kind of look for folks who are kind of already recognizing and taking some fundamental responsibility and somewhere in that invisible place of heart and soul are really saying, I want to change this and I know I can't do that alone and I need to be around other people. That might not be where those two people are. You know, none of us know exactly where people are in the stage of change. So I would, I would also just throw that out. You know, lest you think that, oh, you know, in the post sort of analysis, those two didn't work. Fast forward five years, some other volunteers, maybe that primed the pump, so to speak. Well, one of them's back in prison, and we haven't let him go. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're hoping to reconnect with him when he comes back out. Mm, that's a good uh, idea. Still with us, so I understand mm -hmm. your point. I appreciate it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. With the healthy relationships, I do want to point out, too, um, I'm a supporter of bringing our out-of-state inmates back to Vermont. Um, I feel like shipping our inmates out of state is not helping with building healthy relationships. We are tearing those families apart. We are removing any supports that they had by sending them out of state because most of the people that are incarcerated are low income. I know that I can't afford to fly to Michigan to go see my husband if he was incarcerated. Um, and I guarantee most of the families that are dealing with that are in the same position too, so. You can't beat the odds when you succeed, too. So just thinking about the flip side to that. So it, I think personally about like, wow, if I were in those shoes, like I had to get to that programming and get like, I'd be done before the, the, the end of the week with what most people on furlough have to do. I just would not have the wherewithal and the resilience and the grit and those things. So. I don't know, I'd also encourage us to say like, hey, that one first COSA, that's one more person and potentially a generational thing who somehow left, uh, you know, without that COSA probably wouldn't have. So the diagnosis is a tough one. Anyone that you can get a better outcome, we should collectively pat ourselves on, on the back, including that core member, him or herself too, you know, and do a we did it, we beat the odds. And whenever we know that something like furlough doesn't work because it's so difficult, we yeah. need to all be talking to our legislators saying, why don't we change the rules around furlough so it doesn't have a 98% success, you know, a failure rate, for example. I made that number up. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's very, very hard. As, as Derek said, it's very hard. Let, let's keep pushing against the things that don't work and demanding that they change. They can change. None, none of this is written in stone, right? Susie, can you say a little more about what we can do with regard to contacting our legislators, what bills we might be advocating for, what's happening legislatively? I'll pick one example uh, right now. Um, some of you, how many people here read BT Digger online? So many of you probably saw, maybe you saw that, it came out yesterday, last night, the article around the fact that uh, the Department of Corrections, which by the way, must have a plan to deal with the folks who are now in Michigan, right? That, that's their job, they have to. They have gotta find another place for them. They're having a hard time doing that, 
they are having a hard time getting a, a potential contract. But the contract that they are proposing is a contract that has a three-year uh, minimum that, uh, that we would agree to, have to pay for 250 beds. So we'd be guaranteeing 250 out-of-state prisoners for three years. Um, that clearly is a terrible idea, right? Okay, so everybody gets that that's a terrible idea. You know, here's corrections over here saying, well, you know, we've got to, we have to find some place for them. We can't find another place. So it's not corrections problem. This is why it's important that we talk about the whole entire system. The, it is legislators who have the power to say, okay, there are ways that we can end the unnecessary incarceration of enough Vermonters in the state in the next month so we don't need an out-of-state contract. That's the solution. When people say, what's the solution? to not having to have an out-of-state contract, uh, to having an out-of-state contract. It's not needing the out-of-state contract. So we have people who, that have been mentioned, you know, Megan mentioned 150 people are being held for lack of housing. There are hundreds, literally hundreds of people who are reincarcerated uh, right now for technical violations. That is something DOC could do, but they need some political cover from legislators and from the public to say, yeah, we, uh, we agree. Well, let me, let me finish one other thing. The third one, that <laughs> <laughs> we also hold people for lack of monetary bail. And Megan gave an example there too. Her, she was not held, she was, if you can get out because you have money, you know, then we shouldn't have monetary bail. That means people who don't have money can't get out, right? You can hold people, the state can hold people for without bail. You know, if they are risk of flight or if they have been charged with a, a violent offense. You don't need to have monetary bail. There are other jurisdictions who have gotten rid of monetary bail, which is now used to hold people who are at risk of non-appearance. What other places have found is that all you need to do is text somebody, remind them that they need to show up. We don't need to hold somebody in jail for months or a year who's going to have a, um, come up and have their trial be dealt with or have their case be dealt with in a year. There are hundreds of those people in jail right now. These are three cases of, three examples of unnecessary incarceration that could be dealt with in the next couple of months, or you know, the next couple of weeks, but let's say the glacial pace of legislative change, it takes a couple of months, okay, fairly. So we don't actually need this out-of-state contract. If we have these people out of state and we don't reduce we, the numbers of unnecessarily incarcerated people now, then we will have to have an out of state contract. And if the best that DOC can do is this three year guaranteed 250 people in out of state, you know, God forbid, but we may end up there. So the argument for all of us is legislators, do something now to end unnecessary incarceration. Mm -hmm. That's the message. And out of the 150 are on lack of housing, 50 of them are nonviolent offenders. I want to point out. <laughs> They're all eligible for release, though. All yes. Other yes. Eligible under all other circumstances, except for the lack of housing. Yeah, I think I just, note, just to back up that everything that Susie said, I think. You know, ultimately, right? We have a democratic process. Everybody gets to vote for their for their representatives in, uh, at a local level and in the in the legislature. Um, and I think part of the question becomes, how are our uh, legislators from any of our communities um, held to account for the aggregate impact of you know whatever policies? That, that they support. So I mean, I think a lot of this is about participatory democracy. We're focused on the criminal justice system because it's, uh, it's so pervasive. But I, I just, I, you know, I think one of the real questions is how do communities rally enough of a vision for a different set of values that should be reflected in their vision of justice that either um, their current representatives are clearly signaled or different ones who maybe don't carry those values. You know, I think, I think that's the challenge, but the promise that, that sits out there. Certainly Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform is doing a, a very strong job convening those conversations and having a coalition across the state that's, that's, that's you know, pressing that. Um, so, thank you.
Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I've been sitting here thinking about what you brought up, Jacob, and, and uh, <coughs> I know what you observe is true, and the extent to which those people who are involved in the criminal justice system have um, been victims in their own families is, is huge. And, um, you know, I'm thinking, what, how, how can we support healthier families as a community? How can we do more prevention and not try to clean up the messes? And it's just, I know that the Department for Children and Families have, have um, been interested in restorative practice to the extent that they uh, use a, a meeting that's, affords some degree of, of agency to the families themselves. But wonder if what would happen if, if um, <coughs> those families that are come to their attention were afforded COSAs mm -hmm. so that we as a community start to show up in really meaningful, long-term ways individually with families. I think there'd be a lot of hope there. I'm hoping I can um, say concisely just what I'm feeling sitting back here. Um, I appreciated your questions and the, your insight into those situations and, and the responses too about what organizationally and systemically we can do. But I just, I realize that one of the things that coming to something like this does for me is it just um, reminds me how important um, my own views, my own um, spiritual practice, my own way of speaking about what others do, you know, how important that is. Um, and I've had a personal experience uh, with somebody that I knew who went to jail. And I know that it was um, so very difficult because on one hand, I, um, I wanted to see the good and, and, and consider the background that led to you know, what had come up. And I, um, at the same time, I had some of my own personal fears um, about um, you know, more, um, you know, my, some of the people that I could see might be affected by um, certain behaviors or certain things that I, I, I didn't know about. Um, but anyway, I, I guess I just want to say that um, I've appreciated uh, having the exposure to Buddhism, which is really um, seeing Buddha nature to, you know, other spiritual practices, Quakerism, that of God and everyone, or, or just, you know, the, just the idea that, that um, we have to look um, beyond our judgments or our labels and, and, and see something bigger and something better in everyone. And I feel like it was so beautifully articulated in what everyone, in everybody's shared tonight. And, you know, all the practices of writing to prisoners, you know, your devotion, Rick, to for so long writing to prisoners. I know Buddhist Peace Fellowship has also done that as a way of just helping people that don't see the good in themselves begin to feel like somebody believes in them and that they too can believe in themselves. So, um, you know, I just encourage all of us to, to be careful about our speech and how we, you know, talk about someone. I think out of my mouth has come, he's just an angry man. Well, somebody had said that to me. And, and, and so then, you know, you got to think about like, how does that communicate, get communicated to somebody who's just a human being who had a situation where their feelings took over? You know, so I just, you know, again, it's, it's a lot of words not really organized, um, but I feel like this is an opportunity for us to look, you know, systemically and organizationally and, you know, all the different ways that we can um, uh, influence these kinds of things that we're seeing going on and that, you know, the injustices, you know, for people that are human and that they are, um, you know, they're living out their lives as a result of, of perhaps what happened with them. So 
um, is just like a little reminder. And I want to thank all of you for being here and the Buddhist Peace Fellowship for giving us the opportunity. And this isn't in any way to end things, but I just feel like I wanted to say that personal thing was kind of sitting in me. So, thank you. Thank you guys for coming out. It, it is time to end, and that was a beautiful way to do it. Uh, thank you to everybody who has come and shared their experiences and their visions and their concerns. And before we leave, I would like to just quote from another Buddhist teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. Your mind is like a piece of land planted with many different kinds of seeds. Seeds of joy, peace, mindfulness, understanding, and love. Seeds of craving, anger, fear, hate, and forgetfulness. These wholesome and unwholesome seeds are always there, sleeping in the soil of your mind. The quality of your life depends on the seeds you water. If you plant tomato seeds in your garden, tomatoes will grow. Just so, if you water a seed of peace in your mind, peace will grow. When the seeds of happiness in you are watered, you will become happy. When the seed of anger in you is watered, you will become angry. The seeds that are watered frequently are those that will grow strong. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be safe from harm. May all beings enjoy happiness. May all beings dwell in an open heart. <laughs>